start us off. So hello and welcome. I'm Joan Alacqua. I am uh, Executive Director of the History Project. And for those of you who are new to the History Project or new to the Art Out of the Archive series, we are Boston's LGBTQ community archives. We're 501c3, we're volunteer driven, and we are dedicated to documenting, preserving, and sharing LGBTQ history. And like I said, I'm so happy to invite you here to our digital out of the archives Zoom. Um, while we are still socially distanced, even though Massachusetts is inching towards reopening, uh, we launched a crowdsourced digital project that I'd like you all to participate in. It's called hashtag queer archives at home. Um, and it's a space where we and the LGBTQ community can come together during this time by sharing our personal history, whether that's um, sharing photographs or stories or your t-shirts from pride marches or protests. Um, do me a favor while you're at home, check out your closets and your attics, take a photo and add yourself to our community story. Um, also, while we are socially distancing, um, if you are able to help us to achieve our mission during this unprecedented time um, by making a donation to the History Project, we'd really appreciate it. Um, we also have created a store, so there's some swag if you're interested in history, queer history swag, um, and I'll post links to all of that in the chat. So, uh, now that the spiel's over, I'd now like to introduce our special guests today, Megan Linger and Megan Michael. So Megan Linger has worked for the National Parks of Boston since 2017. Megan completed a master's degree in history at Simmons, focusing on public history and the stories of LGBTQ plus Americans. Prior to that, they attended and earned a bachelor's degree at the University of Pittsburgh. Megan Michael has worked at the Longfellow House, Washington's headquarters National Historic Site since 2018. She previously worked at the National Parks of Boston, Appomattox Courthouse National Historical Park, and Gettysburg National Military Park. She's currently working on her bachelor's degree in history. So Megan and Megan, I turn the floor over to you. Fantastic, thank you so much, Joan. Um, all right, so let me get this. My screen shared. Hang on just a second. Come on. All right, there we go. So thank you again for coming. Um, I am Megan Linger, as Joan said. Um, this program is going to be focusing on um, how National Park Service sites in the greater Boston area um, are working on sharing the stories of LGBTQ Americans. Um, so it's a great work in progress. It's something we're very excited about um, and can't wait to share it all with you. So, hang on, oops, hang on, oops, too many times, there we go. All right, so, to begin, who are we? Um, we already had a really great introduction, but just for a little bit about our specific sites. I work at Longfellow House, Washington's headquarters, National Historic Site, and our site preserves the home of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, who was one of the world's foremost 19th century poets, and certainly one of the most famous American poets in the world. And it was also George Washington's headquarters, really throughout the Siege of Boston, right at the very beginning of the American Revolution. And that is our main topics that we discuss at our site. But as this lecture is going to show, there are many different subjects that we can discuss as well. Yes, very, very much so. Um, and I definitely know a thing or two about having a lot of different stories um, because those other three photos on the slide um, are all um, kind of in my, my wheelhouse at the National Parks of Boston. So the National Parks of Boston are um, ac actually consists of three uh, National Park Service sites. Um, Boston National Historical Park, um, Boston African American National Historic Site, and uh, Boston Harbor Islands National and State Park. So 
these different sites um, all cover different aspects of uh, American history, ranging from uh, the American Revolution to the abolitionist movement uh, to um, modern environmentalism efforts. Um, all of these different uh, stories come together at these uh, three sites. Um, and for, again, same with the Longfellow House, much, much more than that as well. Um, so to dive into um, what the National Park Service more broadly is up to, um, we really start the story um, in earnest in 2016. Um, I think that's where a lot of um, our present day efforts uh, seem to kick off. So in 2016, that's the year that the National Park Service as a whole pre uh, celebrated its centennial. Um, and as we were looking back over the previous 100 years, we were looking ahead to what the next 100 years were going to look like. And as we did that, we were really thinking about um, what we could do uh, to celebrate the diversity and um, amazing uh, range of stories that exist in the United States. Um, so, one of these uh, first big things that you saw coming out in 2016 was the LGBTQ America theme study. Uh, Joan, I know you just had the link to the page, so um, if that could get thrown in the chat, that would be super, super awesome. Um, so this theme study is incredibly long. I've actually not managed to read the whole thing cover to cover just yet, um, <laughs> but it has a number of different uh, incredible stories uh, compiled by uh, a number of different researchers and um, academics looking at different aspects of LGBTQ history from around the country from many different uh, individual cultures. Um, so this, this study really gave us a lot to, a lot to work with, a lot to consider, a lot to, a lot to um, uh, play with for this second century outlook we were developing. Um, on top, and uh, on, that is not all that we did in 2016. Megan? So another thing that we did in 2016 was we added one of our newest National Park Service sites, and that is Stonewall National Monument. Um, to commemorate the Stonewall riots, the Stonewall uprising that took place 51 years ago. And as of this date, it is the only National Park Service site specifically dedicated to LGBTQ history. That is its primary goal. That is the history that it represents. And it was definitely a major pivotal moment in the history of the Park Service to have this added. But even though it's the only park specifically dedicated to LGBTQ history, it's not the only park that talks about it. Across the country, national park sites are starting to interpret LGBTQ history. They're starting to get more involved in the LGBTQ community. I mean, it's very obviously safe to say that many rangers are LGBTQ themselves. And in 2018, on a much more local level, Many National Park Service sites in the Boston area marched in Boston Pride um, for, I believe, one of the very first times. And then last year in 2019, a larger contingent of National Park Service sites also began to march in the annual Pride Parade, including Longfellow House for the first time. And it was actually my first Pride, and that was a really quite a lot of fun for me as well. Um, so that's just some of the big scale things that we're doing. but. We're just two sites researching these stories and trying to interpret these stories. And there's so much to talk about, but we wanted to focus in on some of the things that we specifically are doing at our parks and focus on two stories in particular. And that's really what we're gonna be talking about tonight. All right. And before we really um, dig into these uh, two individuals' amazing stories, um, I want to pose a uh, question for dialogue. Um, so, have you ever been afraid to be yourself? And if so, what did you do to become less afraid? 
Um, this is where the chat function in Zoom comes in handy quite well. So if you feel like answering this question uh, at any time during the program, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, if you feel like that's uh, a little too personal, putting you on the spot a little too much, um, that is totally uh, fine and you don't have to answer this, but I encourage you no nonetheless to kind of think it over all the same and uh, take it with you after the program is over. Um, so I'll give you another, another second to think that out. All right. So let's begin. All right. Uh, Longfellow is going first. Um, this is pretty chronological, which is very helpful. And the figure that I'm going to be talking about is the Reverend Samuel Longfellow, uh, who was born in 1819. Uh, he was Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's youngest brother. Um, and he has quite a bit to do with my park. He's definitely a figure we don't get to talk about very much, but he lived in the Longfellow house for a number of years throughout his life. He first moved to Cambridge in 1835 to begin attending Harvard University and later went on to attend Harvard Divinity as well. Uh, but on top of that, he also traveled throughout New England, throughout the Northeast. He spent a number of years in Brooklyn, New York. And last year, as you can see, was his birthday. It was his 200th anniversary. So we wanted to dig into him a bit more and find out more about who he was as a person. And I immediately wanted to be the Sam person at my park. I wanted to learn as much about him as I could. And as I started researching him a little bit more, another important aspect of what we were doing last year is it really was the first year that we began to incorporate LGBTQ history into as many of our daily programs as we could, because our site has a long history of this. What we never really could confirm is if Sam Longfellow fit into that story or not. Um, fortunately, as I was digging in, our old site manager, Jim Shea, uh, pointed me in Sam's direction to maybe look into Sam's sexuality. And that got me very excited. <laughs> Um, so I started pouring into his journals, his letters, when I noticed that there was a bit of a discrepancy in one of the transcriptions. Um, there was something very off about it. It was partially done. A more modern transcription noted that there was something like stuck to the page. And I wanted to see the journal itself to see what was going on. And when I was put, let into the archives to look at the actual journal, we found something really cool. We found in his journal two pages that had previously been sealed shut. And we have a photo here of Sam's journal. Um, and as you can see in the different corners, you see the remnants of sealing wax um, that Sam Longfellow had tried to close together uh, to make sure that nobody read those pages. And that really leads us into the contents of what was on those pages. In 1837, Sam Longfellow wrote a long passage in his journal about a classmate of his named William Winter. Um, Longfellow and Winter had been friends for about a year at that point when he writes this journal entry. And it is the very first time that Sam actually talks about him in his journals. And this is the passage that Sam tried to hide. Fell into a most sentimental reverie about W.W. The scenes of last spring came back to me with a sadness. In short, I mused myself into a most romantic melancholy. I've thought a good deal about him in, of late in my musings and sometimes feel as if I should go crazy when I think of last year. I don't think I have made a greater sacrifice of inclination to a sense of duty, but not a hearty one. I was reluctant then. I have been sorry at times ever since. It was a strange infatuation. And yet after all my fears, might we not have been happy together? I loved him and think he liked me. And then he sealed that journal entry up to make sure nobody else ever read it. But that is not 
the end of this particular story. Sam does write about William Winter a few more times. A year later, he writes in his journal that William Winter came back into his life. Willie Winter came and stayed a while, for whom my passion is revived. I sit next to him at table and look into those eyes of his full of fun. A day later, he wrote in his journal, am too sleepy to read over sound, so we'll leave it till morning and go to sleep to dream of, name erased, eyes. And that is the last mention we ever have of William Winter again. Uh, William Winter does end up marrying and moving to Mississippi, and there doesn't seem to be any more contact from that point onward. But that's just the first example we have of Samuel Longfellow, and a pretty strong case for him being attracted and, as he said, in love with other men. The next big example I have takes place a few years later with another William named William Tiffany. Um, Longfellow first met William Tiffany around 1843 or so, and the first insight we have into Sam's feelings for Tiffany occurred on New Year's Day in 1845. Um, and I do have that quote on the left. On my way home, I stopped in at William's room to give him a little volume of Emerson as a New Year's gift and pledge of love. And throughout the month of January, he is constantly writing about William Tiffany in his journals, uh, talking about trying to see him, romantic strolls, events they're going to together, and a number of events where they keep getting third wheeled by all of their friends. <laughs> and Sam complaining that he just wants to be alone with William Tiffany. Uh, but by the middle of the month, William did have to go back down to Baltimore to be with his family for winter break. And Sam writes in his journal, William left for Baltimore. I went down to say goodbye. Dear William, I trust nothing from without or within will interfere in his complete success. As I said goodbye, I kissed his round cheek. My first kiss. Dear William, my blessing goes with you. And even though a kiss on the cheek definitely sounds quaint by today's standards, the fact that Sam made an effort to put in his journal that this was his first kiss definitely shows that this was a fundamentally important moment for him in his life. And just to make it even sadder and kind of show what living in the 19th century could often be like, he was around 25 when this happened. Um, in the end, much like William Winter, the story of William Tiffany ends in a very similar way. Uh, William Tiffany does end up getting married. He did start a family. But the difference between Winter and Tiffany is that he and Sam still stayed friends. They have a correspondence that spans for decades. And the friendship really didn't seem to suffer. I obviously can't say if this is requited or not, but it is clear that Tiffany was a very important person in Sam's life. But this isn't the last story. There's one other major person in Sam Longfellow's life, and this one doesn't get married. Uh, so I think this is probably one of the happiest stories that I can tell for Sam. Um, and this is with another Sam named Samuel Johnson. Uh, the two of them first met in 1842 when Johnson was giving a speech at Harvard Yard and Sam writes in his journal that night that he was captivated by this eloquent speaker. A few months later, he finds out that they are going to be classmates and the two of them instantly become best friends. Sam Johnson makes up the bulk of Sam Longfellow's correspondence, over a hundred letters, and we really don't have that many for any of his other correspondences. And they talked about everything. They talked about religion, friends, family, hobbies. Um, pretty much anything that anyone would talk about was in their letters to each other. And this relationship between the two of them lasted for about 40 years. And the reason why we have such a strong argument in favor of this being more than just a romantic friendship in the platonic sense is that even their friends commented on it. Um, Longfellow's other really close friend was a man named Edward Everett Hale. 
And he wrote that there existed for 40 years an intimacy which could hardly have been understood by David and Jonathan. And throughout the 19th century, references to David and Jonathan in the Bible, references to the ancient Greeks, were very popular euphemisms um, that were used at the time to really talk about same-sex love. And a bit more on the nose was another friend of theirs, Joseph May. The confidential intercourse between Mr. Longfellow and Mr. Johnson discloses a perfect harmony and the unrestricted but delicate intimacy of two rare and noble spirits. Letters frequent and full, usually serious, often playful, always affectionate, passed between the pair. No experience was passed over unnoted. No emotion was unshared between these two friends. They found in each other something of that support and comfort which they were not seeking in the marriage state. So it's very clear that this was, without a doubt, the most important relationship in Sam Longfellow's life. Um, unfortunately, um, as time progressed, Samuel Johnson did pass away in 1882. And Sam Longfellow really dedicates his life from that point on to preserving Samuel Johnson's memory. He publishes his letters and memoirs. He constantly writes about him. And Sam begins to take a more active role in sort of the LGBT community of Cambridge at that point. He became a mentor for a lot of young gay Harvard students, in court, uh, including uh, William Morton Fullerton, uh, who went on to have a very fascinating life, probably most famous for his affair with Edith Wharton. Uh, so we have a lot of interesting connections at our site. Um, but in the end, Sam Longfellow passed away in 1892. And his most enduring legacy is the hymn books that he wrote. Um, these were very popular hymn books throughout the 19th century. Uh, they were pretty universally used for a long period of time. And those hymn books were ones that he wrote with Sam Johnson. Um, and I just find it really sweet that his most enduring legacy was something that they made together. Um, and I kind of think that they would probably feel the same way. But what are we doing about this? What has come out of all of this research? Last year, I did a specialty tour about Sam's life, and a lot of that included the new discoveries that I've just been discussing. We've also just published an article for his 201st birthday, specifically talking about his sexuality, and I'll definitely be happy to post that in the chat. But he's only one example of the stories that we can tell, and we'll talk a bit more about that later on. Now I think I need to give the floor over to Megan to start talking about what Boston is doing. All right. Let me advance the slideshow. Two years after Samuel Longfellow died, uh, the torch was passed, so to speak, um, when somebody else was born. Prescott Townsend came from a very distinguished Boston Brahmin uh, lineage. Um, I think he'd like me to say that, um, as he often wrote himself, that he had ancestors that uh, came over on the Mayflower, uh, no less than 23 of them. Um, he had ancestors that signed the Declaration of Independence, the Articles of Confederation, uh, the U.S. Constitution, um, all sorts of different things. And he appeared right at the end of this uh, blue-blooded line. Um, and uh, Townsend, for quite a bit of his youth, um, followed a very uh, conventional path for someone of his station. Uh, he was part of the Harvard University class of 1918, um, his studies somewhat interrupted by the outbreak of World War I. Um, and as many uh, young man did at that time, uh, he went off and served, in his case, in the Naval Reserve. Um, when he returned, Townsend uh, attempted uh, to go to Harvard Law School, but after a year, he decided it, it simply wasn't for him. Um, and that's where Townsend's uh, life really took a different direction. Um, so prior to even getting into Harvard, Townsend had 
at one point sat down with his uh, with his parents when he was only a teenager, and he later related um, to friends that he had said at that point that he was a, homo a homosexual, that he was interested in men. And his parents had a very um, surprising uh, approach to being told this news in the very, very early 1900s. They actually um, told him, that's all right, just as long as you be careful. Um, and that advice to be careful uh, clearly had a lot of weight. Um, so later on in his life, in 1969, uh, he told uh, Randy Wicker in an interview for uh, a, pu a publication called Gay Magazine, um, I didn't ever feel guilty. I wasn't guilt-laden, but I was very frightened. I wanted so much to meet someone, and I still regret one time when a very attractive fellow tried to pick me up, and because I was scared, I didn't take him home. I had my first experience at 19, but after that, I really didn't have any more contacts during the World War. Um, as for that uh, contact at the age of 19, um, the first uh, person that Townsend ever um, had any sort of uh, sexual relationship with, uh, the late Douglas Shand Tucci wrote in uh, the book, The Crimson Letter, that that uh, young man um, was named Frederick Henry Harvey. So that's him in the uh, top left corner. Um, and as for that kind of um, fear that um, kind of stopped him from uh, acting on his desires for a while, um, he, had, he had good reason to be afraid. There, was, there were severe consequences for being caught at this, at this point in time. The, you would still see the um, old laws against homosexual behavior being, uh, being enforced. And uh, decades after uh, the World War I era, during World War II, as, as it would happen, um, Prescott Townsend um, did learn what could happen if you were not, as his parents put it uh, when he was young, careful. Um, so this is, so up on the, uh, uh, top right of the of the slide, you see um, a photo from the um, intake records for the Deer Island Penitentiary, um, part of the Boston Harbor Islands, actually. Um, but today, um, pretty well known for being uh, where you have the uh, wastewater treatment plant um, near the airport. Um, but at the time, there was a prison there, and this is when you saw. Um, Prescott Townsend uh, going into prison for 18 months, having committed an unnatural and lascivious act, to quote the um, specific charge. Um, after, um, after he was released from prison, Townsend found that uh, life was not going to be quite the same. Uh, he found that, and he later, and he later would brag about this, um, that he had been, while he had been in prison, his name had been uh, silently scrubbed from the social register. The uh, books that come out apparently in high society that list off the uh, names and achievements of people in the um, ranks of high society. Um, there hadn't been any fuss, there hadn't been any letters telling him, how dare you, how could you do this? Um, it was quick, it was silent, it was as if he had never been there. Um, and the Prescott Townsend uh, that emerged from uh, that emerged from prison with his uh, family ties and um, social status a bit uh, uh, chipped away, he found that at this point he had nothing to lose and everything to gain. Um, this is where we come to one of my absolute favorite Prescott Townsend quotes. Um, he wrote this in 1963, looking back on his life in uh, the 45th anniversary report for the Harvard class of 1918. The third and last phase in my life has been the fight for social justice. This has also been the most fun. So Prescott Townsend um, uh, 
before his arrest and really doubling down after his release, um, emerged as an uh, incredible, um, uh, an incredible uh, neighborhood eccentric. I think we could. I think we could safely say uh, he was a patron of the arts um, before uh, and after uh, Deer Island and. Uh, Jocelyn, I do see your hand. Um, uh, could we just hold on for just a second, though? Um, we're going to handle the questions uh, to closer to the end, if that's cool. Um, so Townsend, hang on. Um, where was I? Once he, once he emerged from custody, Townsend's purpose was redoubled. There are some sources that say that he was going into the uh, Massachusetts State House demanding uh, the decriminalization of homosexual behaviors um, as early as the 1930s, but um, until I get the chance to really dig into the general court's uh, nitty-gritty records of their daily doings, um, I've been having trouble finding uh, the primary sources that would back that up. Um, but Townsend, uh, regardless, came out of prison um, at a really perfect moment. So starting in the early 1950s with uh, the creation um, in other cities of the first chapters of the Mattachine Society and the Daughters of Belitis as very early um, LGBT rights organizations, um, you, um, you had activity really taking off in Boston as well, and Prescott Townsend eager to lead that charge. Um, the difficulty with Prescott Townsend is that the other members of the Boston chapter of um, the Vanishing Society, which um, in most things really deferred to the larger and uh, arguably better organized New York chapter, um, the other members didn't really want Townsend there. Um, for one thing, Townsend, even in the even in the uh, 1950s was um, uh, enjoying his eccentric reputation and his proposed tactics really pushed up against what the other members of the society wanted to do at that early stage. Um, other members of the, of the Mattachine Society that he uh, wrote letters back and forth with told him, no, 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 we cannot be uh, petitioning legislatures right now. Um, right now we need to focus on getting lawyers and uh, psychiatrists to um, respect us and then we can worry about changing laws. It's far too early. What you're, do what you're proposing is far too risky for most of us. Um, because even though Prescott Townsend no longer had anything to lose, a lot of the other members of uh, the Boston Mattachine Society um, did. They had families and careers that um, they did not want to, at that, at that stage of the game, ruin. Um, and so that's why you had a lot of letters um, reading around, uh, writing around Prescott Townsend, um, saying, if we can't get rid of him, we can at least try to... Um, keep him under control. That's um, a pretty close paraphrase of one of the letters I read from one Boston Mattachine uh, member to another. It's just like, wow. <laughs> okay, guys. Um, so after he was uh, finally pressured to uh, quit the Boston chapter of the Mattachine Society, which really uh, ceased to exist um, not long after that in the early 1960s, Prescott Townsend formed his own organization. He called this the Demophile Center, um, and it was very, very small. Um, at the talks, probably uh, no more than a couple dozen uh, at, at the very most gathering in Townsend's home, uh, talking about the um, issues of the day. He printed a, a newsletter also out of his home, um, and he made appearances um, at um, public demonstrations uh, carrying the banner of the Demophile Center. Um, such an example was in 1965 when he and a bunch of other um, luminaries in the early movement uh, pre-Stonewall uh, showed up to uh, uh, showed up to um, 
an important location in New York and protested the uh, Castro regime's treatment of gay people in uh, communist Cuba. Um, so he was there, um, Randy Wicker was there, the poet Allen Ginsberg, and um, his partner, the poet Peter Orlovsky, um, I'd like to say Dick Leitch and uh, Frank Kameny were also there. It's kind of a who's who list of uh, pre-Stonewall uh, gay activists. So at, toward the end of Townsend's life, as I uh, mentioned on his introductory slide, he passed away in uh, 1973, um, was something that occurred 50 years ago Sunday. And that was the very first Pride Parade in New York, um, also otherwise known at that time as Christopher Street Liberation Day. Um, and he went to the he went to that first Pride. Um, Randy Wicker, who I've mentioned um, in this presentation already, is the man who interviewed him. Um, is on the right with the camera slung over his shoulder. Um, and this is kind of the moment of uh, just like Samuel Longfellow had kind of passed the torch to people younger than him. Um, here is um, almost a moment of Townsend passing the torch to um, this next generation uh, that was coming up um, toward the end of his life. And as we look at um, these quotes on the left, where did these quotes come from? They're pretty recent. Um, well, the problem with pre studying Prescott Townsend is the sources are, can be a little tough to, tr to track down. Uh, Townsend's homes in both Boston and Provincetown um, were largely destroyed um, by a series of fires in the late 1960s and early 1970s. So as far as things that he wrote, um, we, he himself wrote, we don't have it, we don't have a ton of it. Um, and he didn't um, publish very many things formally um, either. It's not like um, he and uh, any partner of his wrote uh, hymn books that went into circulation for decades after his death. Um, so that's the difficulty with Townsend. Um, and so when I was uh, digging into, into Townsend, I had the idea, um, what if lacking primary sources, I made some new ones? <laughs> so making new primary sources, I, um, actually sat down with and uh, spoke to um, two of Prescott Townsend's friends, including Randy Wicker, who is uh, pictured on the right once again, um, and Joe McGrath, who was kind of a jack of all trades in Townsend's life. Um, Joe was kind of his uh, secretary, driver, property manager, um, all sorts of roles um, throughout the 1960s. And it was really, really an honor to speak with both of these men. and. As in both of these interviews, after I'd read so, so much about, about Prescott, it was, still, it was still incredible to hear, hear the stories from people who actually knew him. It was as if he was there. He was still here. And to both of these gentlemen, I asked um, um, what they thought Prescott Townsend's legacy ought to be, because it hasn't been widely written what his legacy ought to be. Um, there are some books, including um, the 1990 book, improper, uh, 1998 book, uh, Improper Bostonians, published by the History Project, that talk, to, talk about him um, a bit, but he's largely vanished from a lot of the wider conversations. So what should this legacy be? Uh, Joe McGrath said, well, I think Prescott was ahead of his times in many ways vis-a-vis -vis the gay rights area, and I think that while he may not have been able to affect any dramatic change in his lifetime, he got the ball rolling in certain areas. He maybe at least began to talk about gay rights, and I think that's basically his legacy, being an early speaker for gay rights. And Joe had a lot more to say uh, talking about um, uh, Townsend's uh, work as an architect, um, he had dabbled in architecture and uh, created possibly one of the first um, uh, solar powered houses, house designs um, in the US and actually built it um, by, his, by himself in Provincetown. 
Um, and then there's Randy Wicker, who um, mentioned, mentioned, of course, his contribution to the movement, but also took a more personal direction, uh, thinking about um, how when he met Towns, when he met Townsend, it was proof that it was possible for somebody to um, be gay and live to a ripe old age and be happy. And he cited, even then, after after all these years, um, a motto of Townsend's. Um, well, to me, he has only one legacy, and it's love, money, uplift. Um, those were things that uh, Townsend really emphasize, emphasized a lot. And that doing for others brings you happiness. Those are the two most important statements you'll ever hear anyone make. So as we um, roll on into the end, um, I do just want to note that uh, not to put you on the spot or anything, but uh, I seem to think, I seem to believe that uh, Randy Wicker is actually here tonight. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, and as we roll into our conclusion to this uh, uh, collage that I spent a lot of time on, as it, as it were, um, there are so many more stories that we can tell. Both of the stories we, we highlighted um, today were about, you know, cisgender, white, gay men. And we love and appreciate their stories very, very much, though that is uh, not the limit to what we can do. It's only the beginning. Um, so represented here are photos of uh, people and stories that um, we can either highlight right now um, with the research that we've done um, in future programming or stories that we can handle in the future. Um, specifically, Megan, what do we have? Uh, so we are currently working on a number of different programs and projects. Um, as far as the Boston end is going, um, you have developed a Prescott Townsend tour uh, that would have debuted had there not been a pandemic. Um, you also have done the oral histories, which are currently being worked on to be polished and made accessible. And Faneuil Hall at Boston also has the ability to interpret the history of Gay Town Meeting and meetings of ACT UP as well. Um, Larry Kramer spoke there a number of times, and I know that's programming that you are currently working on. Um, a joint program that we are planning on working on together is talking a little bit about romantic friendships in the 19th century, focusing on the historical figure that we both kind of have joint custody of, Charles Sumner, and his relationships with people like Samuel Gridley Howe and Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, um, and that's something that we already have in the planning stages of. Uh, but we also are going to be working on a video about Harry Dana, who was Henry Longfellow's grandson and was openly gay. And we've also done a number of articles that have already been published and very happy to post those articles as well. Um, so that's just some of the things we already are working on and there's a lot more on the way after that. All right, absolutely. So as we, as we wrap things up, we, are really excited to see what the future has in store for what Longfellow House and the National Parks of Boston can do together and individually, um, because these are stories that uh, bring out the hopes, the fears, the tragedies and triumphs of the American experience. And it will be our joy and pleasure to share these with you. So to kind of sum up the uh, feelings of uh, this program, um, before we roll it right over into the Q&A, um, we have um, a poem that was written by none other than Samuel Longfellow. And hope that lights her fadeless fires, and faith that shines a heavenly will, and love that courage re-inspires, these stars have been above us still. Look backward how much has been won. Look round, how much is yet to win.
The watches of the night are done. The watches of the day begin. So thank you all uh, for once again for being here. Um, I apologize for any uh, hiccups in my speech, but I am now happy and eager to look at the chat. I was seeing it blow up throughout the program and I can't wait to actually read it. Uh, now um, we would be thrilled to take your questions. Yeah, and folks, if you don't want to be on the recording, put your question in the chat. If you don't mind your face showing up on YouTube later, please use the hand, use the hand raise function and I can click on you. But to kick us off, there's a really great question in the chat uh, for Megan and Megan from Liza. Um, what are the questions we ought to be asking of our NPS sites and stories? What questions will rise up stories that have resonance and deserve light? Um, Let's that see. Is a very, very good question. <laughs> um, what questions. I I think something that the park service is really trying to commit itself to now more than ever is trying to tell more inclusive stories. Um, and maybe the questions we should be asking are things along the lines of who has been excluded. Why have they been excluded and how can we change that narrative? How can we interpret the story of everyone that makes up the history of this country? Um, it's definitely something the Park Service is currently trying to tackle and work on and it's not a thing that's ever going to stop. We are always going to find new stories and there's always going to be things that need to be discussed and there can never be a day that we stop. It has to be an ongoing process. I could not agree more. And I think you, I think you said it. Um, oh, so we have another uh, question from Ken. Will you be doing pride themes tours at Longfellow House? A uh, very good question. Um, we actually have already done a pride theme tour and we are definitely looking to find ways to bring it back. Uh, last season, my colleague Nicole actually did a pride themed tour on the sexuality of Harry Dana, Longfellow's grandson, and Longfellow's daughter Alice, um, who has a very, very fascinating story herself. And because we're being so digital this year, we are looking for ways to either redo that tour or post it in line. It's definitely the planning process, but we want to do more with that program. And I'll be perfectly honest, if I could talk about Sam Longfellow every day, I will. So I'm definitely going to annoy all of my colleagues until I can get a Sam tour done again. <laughs> Great, so I see um, Paul, your hand is up. And so I've unmuted you, or I told you to unmute yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Paul. Hi, bud. Hello. Um, I just wanted to say this was a great presentation. Um, you know, I, I spent my entire childhood and, and young adult life in Boston, and um, I consider myself a history buff. And this is frankly the first time that I, I've heard anything uh, related to LGBTQ plus history um, in the entirety of my 27 year life relating to the city of Boston. So I think. Um, it's a great resource and I, I'm very excited to see what next steps are, are, um, are coming down the pipeline. That's all. Very much. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and um, this is again, a great time to plug the work that the history project um, does. Um, I would say, give them a follow. They do, um, they do this really important work 24 uh, seven or I mean, I wouldn't expect you to work 24-7, but you know what I mean. It's 24-7. <laughs> um, so we have two questions in the chat that are pretty similar to each other. Um, and so one is, for those who are interested in participating in the ever-increasing research into LGBTQ plus stories, where can we start researching? The other question that I think is on like sort of a similar track is, is there a way for folks to get involved um, with this research beyond, um, of course, listening enthusiastically to these much needed stories. Yes, um, those are all uh, really good uh, work in progress kinds of ideas. Um, I know 
Uh, I also saw a couple uh, people pointing out romantic French, uh, uh, not romantic friendships, but Boston marriages, Boston marriages. Um, that is definitely on our to-do list um, as far as programming and research. Um, and as for the, the specific how to get involved, uh, Joan, what, do you, what, do you, what kinds of things do you have coming up as well? Yeah, so, um, I mean, ways you can get involved with the history project specifically, um, we work with, we are volunteer driven, we are a one staff and many very vo dedicated volunteer driven uh, organization. So um, working with us to sort of uncover these narratives to document the history of Boston's queer community over time. Um, when we are allowed to be closer to each other, that might mean uh, volunteering and working with original collections, processing materials, helping us to migrate uh, things from older formats to newer, more accessible digital formats. Um, but while we are uh, socially distanced and still mostly quarantined, a lot of our activities are focused around planning events um, and programs. So one thing you can help us with in particular is if you have a question about LGBTQ Boston or Massachusetts, um, or if you know somebody who researches this topic and wants to share their research, we would love to signal boost them and to host them at one of these out of the archives talks. Um, I feel like I would be remiss to not plug Longfellow as well. It's a bit different this year because of the pandemic. A lot of our researching is done at home, um, but we are always looking for volunteers to transcribe letters and go into the archives when we can go into the archives again. And Longfellow House has a lot of history associated with LGBTQ history. Um, so I, if you definitely want to like help us out, I know we would always be happy to take volunteers. Um, unfortunately, as I said, it's something that will be a bit easier when we can be in person again. But we have a lot there that we're only just starting to dig into as well. So on a personal level, that's definitely an option too. Yeah, so we have um, a question from Bridget. Uh, when researching these men specifically, are there any moments in particular that stand out? Um, for example, stumbling across some sort of unexpected gem, getting to touch some super old of the time item or items? Um, the journal. <laughs> Opening Sam Longfellow's journal and seeing those pages that had been glued together <laughs> with a confession of love was without a doubt the greatest moment of my career. Um, nothing I think will ever beat that. I'm probably going to be chasing that for the rest of my life. Uh, but definitely reading Sam Longfellow's journal and seeing that was the moment that stood out for me the most, especially when I read the journal entry and just how relatable and timeless that quote actually was. Uh, so for me, it would have to be that. Um, and I would say in my case, other than the oral histories, which were um, absolutely a treasure uh, in and of themselves, um, I don't know, I really enjoyed going to Harvard and seeing the um, uh, time that when he was a student at Harvard, Prescott Townsend was uh, begging professors left and right to still be allowed to play intramural tennis while on academic probation. It was just uh, just an ah uh, college kind of story. And getting to hold his, his letters of uh, pleading. That is, um, I mean, what's important to us all when we are on academic probation uh, from Harvard in the early 1900s? Intramural tennis. Um, so, I, I'm, I'm, please keep the questions in the chat going. We go until about eight o'clock, so we have time for a couple more questions. Um, I have a question since we have a lull. So, um, what about lesbians? <laughs> what about lesbians? Oh, no. um, Let's see, as I go back to um, the uh, slideshow, um, I know one, uh, one realm other than, uh, I know Megan's uh, mentioned Alice Longfellow already. I'll talk um, about that in a second. <laughs> yeah, because of our um, 
uh, proximity to Charles Street where they used to live. Um, I have written down, um, so thank you, Will, for pointing out Anne Whitney at Faneuil Hall. Um, Charles Street, um, right at the foot of Beacon Hill, um, a stone's throw away from where Prescott Townsend would eventually live, you had uh, the home of um, Sarah Orne Jewett and Annie Adams Fields. Um, there were very, very uh, notable women uh, among the Boston literati who um, were in a Boston marriage. They were um, together for um, many, many years toward the end of their lives, and um, their letters are their letters are really, really something. Uh, if you get a chance to take a peek at them, and that's a story I'm personally looking forward to doing this deep a dive into next. Um, on our end, we do fortunately have a number of stories about historical, uh, what we would consider to be lesbians. Um, I think the closest connection we have is definitely Alice Longfellow, uh, Henry Longfellow's daughter. Uh, she was in a romantic friendship, a Boston marriage, uh, with a woman named Fanny Stone, I believe was her last name. And they were together for decades. Um, Fanny actually lived at the Longfellow house for years. Um, we don't have a lot of correspondence between them, um, but we do have some, and they write very affectionately. Um, and Alice really made a point of saying that she chose not to get married. Uh, it wasn't that she couldn't get married, she didn't want it. Uh, so that's probably our biggest example. We also have another example that I want to dive into of another one of Longfellow's grandchildren, um, Annie Thorpe, who was also in a Boston marriage with another woman. Um, there's actually a book that was written partially based off of her and her relationship in, I believe, the 80s called The Magnificent Spinster. Uh, definitely want to learn more about them as well. So we do talk about women. Uh, we have a lot that we can start to go with. Great. And so there was a question in the chat, actually, um, from somebody who's not in Massachusetts, who is wondering if we could define Boston marriage. Ooh, excellent question. Ooh, fabulous question. Um, so Boston, a Boston marriage um, refers to the fact that in the late 19th century in um, specifically Massachusetts, you had a lot of these um, colleges cropping up, so many of them uh, women's colleges, and so you have um, like Smith College and um, uh, Wellesley, etc., cetera, uh, showing up, and a lot of the uh, young women of kind of middle and upper class status that were uh, attending these, um, these institutions and wanting to become more educated, um, coincidentally didn't uh, didn't envision a future for themselves that necessarily involved being attached to a man. Um, they were very interested in their independence and one, way, one route to independence was um, uh, finding another woman to uh, cohabitate with, share expenses. It was, um, a lot of it was practicality and in these uh, unions, you see a lot of um, affection as well. Um, so some of these, some of these letters are, uh, incredibly, incredibly touching. I know that, uh, Fields and Jewett, um, actually at one point exchanged rings, um, and they reference these rings in their writings to each other. It's, it's, it's pretty stunning. Yeah. And so Ken pointed out, um, Henry James coined the term Boston marriage in the Bostonians, I think describing a character that was written to be a, written as his sister or something. I'm recalling something that I should have Googled when I had a moment. Yes, um, I believe that's correct. Yeah, so there's, um, I think, one final question. So we're right at eight. Um, and Amelia is wondering if you're noticing any overlap um, in your research with the suffrage movement. A uh, little bit, yes. Um, I know with the Longfellow House, I'm sorry, I'm jumping in on this. Don't, I know don't you've be been sorry. Yeah, it's the the suffrage story is a, is a little a little complicated on the Longfellow side, but um, Boston more generally, uh, yes, you are seeing a lot of involvement um, between um, Bostonian uh, 
with Bostonian women involved with the suffrage movement and a lot of other uh, progressive era um, institution, progressive area movements, um, and women in Boston marriages. It's a pretty, it's a pretty overlapping Venn diagram and a, a big uh, shout out to the uh, birth control movement from the comment section. And I would be remiss if I didn't uh, mention my um, uh, Simmons advisor, Laura Prieto and her um, pointing out of settlement houses for um, immigrants who had uh, recently arrived in Boston. I know that's uh, a much loved pet project there. Um, so all of these different uh, movements, yeah, you absolutely see um, um, some overlap. Some sure. overlap. And yeah, in the collage that I that we featured at the end, I did include a photo that was recently on the Boston African American National Historic Site uh, Facebook page of um, uh, two women in a Boston marriage who uh, had come out of uh, Mount Holyoke, I'd like to say, and who um, uh, were involved in the suffrage movement. Yeah, on the on the Longfellow and Alice was involved in a very behind the scenes sort of way. Uh, vocally, she was much more a proponent for women's education, but definitely exercised the right to vote once she had it. We've been joking about this a lot this season, but the most vocal like person in support of women's suffrage that we really have is Sam Longfellow, hilariously. <laughs> Great, and I'm noticing in the chats, we have a comment, follow or search for Suffrage Saturday for posts um, that Wendy Rouse is writing a book about queer suffragists. Um, the Boston Athenaeum is actually holding a talk, I believe next week, um, about the anti-suffrage movement, which hasn't, there's an overlap with queer history there. I'm not entirely sure what it is, but you should tune into Theo's talk next week if you're interested in that. Um, so yeah, I think just to, to end the night, uh, let's all thank Megan and Megan for this excellent presentation, for all of your research, um, and for, yeah, such a fantastic program. Thank you both so much. Yes, thank, thank you. you all so much. And thank you to Joan and the History Project for uh, hosting this with us. Yeah, happy to do it. We'll have some more uh, NPS history in July, actually. So keep an eye on the History Project social media um, and you'll learn more about what's coming up next. With that, thank you all. Have a great night, everyone. All right, good night, everyone. Night.